Tonight on Cougar News, we find out more on a series of thefts at COC's Valencia campus. Plus, we have an interview with a COC professor who reported on the smuggling of media into North Korea. Also, we see the final high school lapse of an Olympic hopeful swimmer. Cougar News starts now. This is Cougar News. Hello and welcome to Cougar News. I'm Enzo Marino. And I'm Laura Pichla. Here's the latest from the Cougar Newsroom. Former Santa Clarita Mayor George Peterson passed away last Saturday at the age of 90. He died after a long struggle with Parkinson's disease, according to his daughter. Peterson helped Santa Clarita through the 1994 Northridge earthquake, earning him the nickname the Earthquake Mayor. In the aftermath of the quake, the City Hall building was rat-tagged, forcing Peterson to run City Hall out of a tent. Along with his public service, Peterson served as commander of the L.A. County Sheriff's Department for almost 30 years. He played a major role in making Santa Clarita an official city and is remembered for being very caring and giving towards the local community. Authorities are on the lookout for a man who robbed an ATM customer this past Sunday night. The robbery took place at a Wells Fargo at the corner of Wiley Canyon and Lyons Avenue. Sources say a man in a ski mask pointed a gun at a customer and made him withdraw money from his account. The suspect then proceeded to walk away from the scene. The investigation is currently ongoing and if you have any information, please contact the Santa Clarita Sheriff's Department. Coroner's officials have identified the victim of the deadly shooting in Kenyon County last Wednesday afternoon. 21-year-old Ladarian Allen Jr. of Lancaster was the victim identified, deceased with a gunshot wound in Sierra Canyon Apartments. Deputies are still searching for the suspect. 51-year-old Michael Joe McLothen, who allegedly shot Allen. The Sheriff's Department described McLothen as being 6 foot 4 inches and weights about 230 pounds. A woman also suffered a gunshot wound but was reported in stable condition. The incident occurred just after 4 p.m. on the 25,700 block of Sierra Highway. McLothen was last seen in a 2015 black Chevy Impala with license plate number 75TV649. Investigation is still underway on what prompted the fatal shooting. If you have any information regarding the incident, officials encourage you to contact the Sheriff's Department Homicide Bureau at 323-890-5500. We all know it's important to take precautions for earthquakes like storing water in your house or keeping a safety kit in your car. But what if it happens when you're at school? Cougar News takes a closer look at College of the Canyon's efforts to ensure student safety in the event of an earthquake. Here's Austin Westfall. In 1994, an earthquake shook Southern California, damaging freeways, homes, and businesses. Even College of the Canyon sustained damage resulting in classes being held in tents on the upper field for months. The quake occurred on the Northridge Fault, which is not the San Andreas Fault, but is instead a sub-fault of the San Andreas system. The actual San Andreas Fault typically ruptures every 150 years in its southern section. Its last eruption was in 1857, which leads geologists to believe that we are due for the big one. When the San Andreas ruptures, it's going to be much bigger than Northridge was in 94. It's actually going to be 30 to 100 times the energy. So it'll be a lot longer shaking and a lot more intense shaking and, and a lot more risk to structures because that's what hurts you. When structures, human built structures fail, that's what kills people and hurts people. Since 1994, COC has made an effort to ensure all structures on campus are built with earthquakes in mind. So we've retrofitted all of our older buildings like Benelli Hall and Boykin and all the new buildings are built to withstand a very large earthquake. There's all kinds of structural uh, uh, devices in all the buildings now. Um, you'll see them in some of the new buildings like Hasley Hall because it's all exposed, the side with the crossways looking beams and all that. That's all for earthquake safety. For anyone inside these structures when the big one hits, the best thing to do is immediately duck and cover. Once the shaking stops, view the posted evacuation plan which can be found near the doorway of most classrooms. It will tell you where to evacuate specific to your location. 
For more information, visit canyons.edu slash campus safety and click on emergency operation plans. For Cougar News, I'm Austin Westfall. You can never be, that's great reporting from Austin Westfall, I don't think you can ever be too prepared for an earthquake if we, we just saw it in Nepal, sec, their second major earthquake in two and a half weeks. Right, they're just starting to rebuild and reconstruct and it hits and just shows, goes to show you never know when it's going to happen, when it's going to come. At least 50 people are dead and more than a thousand are injured after another earthquake strikes Nepal. Just two and a half weeks after a devastating 7-point earthquake shook the country, a slightly weaker 7.3 earthquake hit Nepal. The epicenter was located east of Kathmandu, near the Chinese border. The quake was felt as far as India, Tibet, and Bangladesh. At least 16 people in India have died. Seismologists say it will like, aftershocks will likely continue through the next few days or even weeks. An Amtrak crash in Philadelphia has left seven people dead and dozens more injured. The train was headed to, from Washington, D.C. to New York and was carrying 238 passengers along with five crew members. Witnesses say the train was coming into a turn when it suddenly shook, then derailed. A number of passengers have been taken to the hospital. This is the second Amtrak crash in a week. The first was bound for New Orleans when it hit a flatbed truck. That crash killed the truck driver and injured two passengers. Santa Clarita has made the list of the top 50 safest cities in California. The city came in at number 38 on the list. Home security system maker SafeWise looked at violent crimes as well as property crimes to rank the cities. Just last week, the city also was named the third safest in the nation. That report was published by Parenting Magazine. They looked at FBI crime data to compile that list. Although the population has increased in recent years, crime is almost 65% lower than the average American city. The Sheriff's Department credits proactive programs and partnerships with schools, businesses, and residents. And that's What's Trending. I'm Judith Rotana. For more stories in and around the Santa Clarita Valley, you can check us out at cougarnews.com. Laura and Enzo, back to you. Thank you, Judith. And now it may seem far off, but election season is starting again. Many presidential primary candidates have been announced. All of them will have a tough race ahead if they want to be the next president of the United States. Scholar Barty gives us a closer look. The 2012 election may have been only three years ago, but the 2016 election is already heating up, with many of the candidates already stepping forward. The packed Republican primary may be the most contended of the two, with six candidates already forward. Senator Rand Paul, Senator Ted Cruz, Senator Marco Rubio, former Governor Mike Huckabee, Dr. Ben Carson, and business owner Carly Fiorina. With so many names forward, it's going to be very hard to clinch the nomination. So the biggest obstacle I'd say right now is that the Republican Party is divided into a, a number of different, different sort of factions. There's a part of the Republican Party that's primarily interested in sort of a muscular foreign policy. There's a part, there's a libertarian part of the party. There's an, what I'll call, for lack of a better word, the establishment wing of the party. And so you have different impulses sort of pulling the Republican candidates. Right now there are so many candidates sort of in the race that they're dividing up these constituencies. There's no one person, at least right now, who is able to attract all of them. Well, on the Democrat side, only two candidates have stepped forward. Former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and Senator Bernie Sanders. Hillary Clinton is the very clear favorite to win the nomination, and Bernie Sanders will have a hard time to overcome that obstacle. Unless Hillary Clinton says or does something incredibly stupid. She's wrapped up the, the money in the party. She's uh, slowly working on the endorsements. Uh, there's really no contender. Uh, Barry Sanders is the candidate that liberals want to pretend has a chance to go ahead and compete against her. He doesn't. He just doesn't. With over a year to go till the end of the primaries, we here at Cougar News will keep you up to date with all the latest information on the race. For Cougar News, I'm Skylar Barty. And now heading closer to home, a local bridge may be getting a new name in memory of a local activist. 
the Santa Clarita City Council on Tuesday. Discuss naming the overpass on Golden Valley Road and State Route 14 in honor of Santa Clarita resident and community leader Connie Warden Roberts. Since the bridge is within control of the California Department of Transportation, Caltrans has control over naming the bridge. The city council is pushing state, legislature, state, state legislators to name the structure after Roberts. She was known as Santa Clarita's own road warrior for her longtime efforts in the city. A recurring problem in the Santa Clarita Valley recently made its way over to College of the Canyons. Brandon Iriarte has more on the catalytic converter thefts at COC. A rash of thefts have been reported at COC's Valencia campus in the last few weeks. Thieves have been stealing catalytic converters from student vehicles in several of COC's parking lots. Um, there were uh, four thefts, I think, in the last three weeks. Three of the thefts took place in the south parking lot near lots 14 and 15. The other theft took place in the north end of campus near Cougar Stadium. Catalytic converters are a device located under the car near the muffler and help control the vehicle's exhaust system by reducing emissions from harmful compounds like nitrogen and carbon monoxide. But why would someone want to steal a part like this? They're being stolen is because of the precious metals. They have platinum, palladium, and robellum. These catalytic converters, I understand they can get about three or four hundred dollars with the precious metals out of them when they salvage them. The best one, of course, being the, uh, the platinum that they use in rings. As for the reason why thieves would target COC, its vast amount of cars and parking lots make COC a preferable target. With the reason behind the thefts apparent, how would a thief steal a catalytic converter from a car like this? The thief just lays underneath the car and he takes the Zaza and then what he does now is he'll cut off the catalytic converters and a good thief can get off with two cats in less than one minute. Sawzall, or reciprocating saw, are a common tool for removing catalytic converters. With the entire process done so quickly, it may be hard to catch a thief in the act. But if you see anyone next to a vehicle as demonstrated, be sure to call Campus Safety at 661-362-3229. For Cougar News, I'm Brandon Arate. As the leading cause of death for college students, suicide has never been a more important topic to discuss. Jamie Broadway was at a College of the Canyons event that deals with this difficult issue. Have you or someone you know just wanted to end it all permanently? Yes, life can get complicated and overwhelming. It's hard to imagine that you can ever bounce back. Suicide is the leading cause of death in college students. But there's hope. Shine a Light on Suicide Prevention took place in the Honor Grove at COC on May 6th and 1,100 lanterns were placed to represent the amount of college students who take their lives annually. Kathleen Snyder, trainer for suicide prevention, spoke to College of the Kenyans about suicide. The pain to die, the pain is overwhelming. They want to live. You and I have to figure out how to help them figure out how to live. Okay, so we can't just go, well, you need to live. How? Well, all you need to do is, well, that's not usually very helpful. So then, again, we go back to, tell me what's going on for you. Because as a person tells you and me their story about why they want to die, almost always in the telling of their story about why they want to die is a story about why they want to live. Remember, if you or somebody you know is having suicidal thoughts, please call the Suicide Prevention Line at 1-800-273-TALK. This is Jamie Broadway with Cougar News. Relay for Life of the Santa Clarita Valley held an event honoring those who have battled cancer. I was there to hear their stories. This is for all the survivors up here in Santa Clarita. I'm celebrating because I'm still here. Last Saturday, the Relay for Life hosted a luncheon at the North Park Community Clubhouse to honor anyone who battled cancer. My aunt was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and she died, unfortunately. My father was diagnosed with liver cancer. He passed away last December, but he fought for about seven years. My grandmother had breast cancer. 
The struggles of cancer have bonded people together, and Relay for Life has become more than a support group. It's family. We find strength in one another. We cry together, we laugh together, and uh, it's a group of people who understand exactly how you feel. Cancer survivor Karen Maybe knows that a simple decision can change your life. Go to the doctor, quick. I waited too long. Cancer does kill. Oftentimes, sharing their own story is the best motivation to help others continue fighting. If you have a family, you're thinking about your children, you think you're not going to be here, and then you change, and then you say, no, it's not going to beat me, I'm going to beat this. Regardless the daily struggles that cancer survivors have to face, today everyone is here to celebrate one thing, life. Fight cancer, because there is hope. Coming up on Cougar News, a new twist on the common library makes its way to Santa Clarita. Plus, we take a look at the worldwide Wings for Life race. Stay tuned. Are you still looking for your school? College of the Canyons is located on scenic rolling hills with competitive programs such as new media journalism, state-of-the-art sports facilities, and a culinary arts program that will be opening their brand new building with three state-of-the-art test kitchens. At only $46 a unit, you will discover that COC is the community college for you. Find out more at www.canyons.edu. I'm Richard Horvitz. I'm Tara Strong. I'm Michael C. Morona. And I'm Danny Tamarelli. Hi, this is Ming Chen. This is Mike Zapsik. Hi, it's Louie Anderson. I'm Weird Al. I'm Florence Henderson. I'm the Grinch. And you're watching. And you're watching. And you're watching. And you're watching. You're watching. And uh, you're watching. And you lucky people are watching. Cougar News. Cougar, Cougar News. News. Cougar News. Cougar News. Cougar News. Cougar News. You're watching Cougar News. So this is for the older ladies. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a cougar. A College of the Canyons professor got a rare look into North Korea for a series of stories he wrote on media smuggling for the Hollywood Reporter. Our own Robert Spallone sat down with Paul Bond on his reporting in one of the most volatile places in the world. It's called the Hermit Kingdom for a reason. The propaganda-run dictatorship of North Korea is well known for keeping any outside influences from entering its country. College of the Canyons adjunct professor and journalist for The Hollywood Reporter Paul Bond traveled to South Korea to cover the balloon drop of the Sony Pictures film, The Interview into North Korea. Human rights activists have been smuggling in outside media in the hopes of embarrassing North Korean President Kim Jong-un. So they have no idea what's going on in the rest of the world. They're only fed pro-North Korean propaganda. And uh, so this whole movement of trying to get American media into this country was going to include the interview, which is a pretty raunchy, pretty silly, pretty stupid movie, but it insults Kim Jong-un, it belittles him, and that is very, very important. Bond faced the potential threat of being hit by gunfire while reporting from the demilitarized zone, a 160-mile border separating North and South Korea. The North Korean military has been known to shoot down the balloons in the past. Uh, I wasn't, I wasn't afraid. I was exhilarated. You know, it's it's the reason I became a journalist, the reason I teach journalism to inspire the next generation of journalists. Uh, this is the kind of story that uh, you know I, I've been wanting to tell for a long time. His reporting led him to hear a number of heart-wrenching stories while spending time with many North Korean defectors who now aid in the balloon drops themselves. One of the biggest questions I asked all these defectors that everybody with me was like, oh my God, how can you ask that question, was what happened to the family you left behind and how do you live knowing that? Because the North Koreans torture and execute your family members when you defect. 
The importance of accuracy is key to Paul Bond's reporting. In such a story where facts could be easily exaggerated might just cause Bond to return back to South Korea. Just so much uh, mythology around it, just trying to get eyeballs. Oh, look at this weird story about there's some smuggling in the interview into North Korea. And they get all their facts wrong, and it's all hyped, and the numbers are all wrong. When I was there, CNN reported that they were trying to smuggle in 100,000 copies of this via balloon. The actual number was 200. So yeah, if I need to go down there and report the truth again because the rest of the media is getting it all wrong, I'll do it. For Cougar News, I'm Robert Spallone. The business of show business is booming at College of the Canyons, but with on-campus filming now an almost weekly occurrence, students and college employees are starting to voice their disapproval. I spoke with both supporters and opponents of on-campus filming, and this is what they had to say. I'm happy to be here in Santa Clarita. I shoot in Santa Clarita. I film on location in Santa Clarita. We film here in Santa Clarita. I film in Santa Clarita. For decades, Santa Clarita has been referred to as Hollywood North, and nowhere is that term more appropriate than at College of the Canyons. Over the years, COC has become a hotbed for on-location filming, everything from promos with Justin Timberlake and luxury car commercials, to major network productions like Chuck and The Amazing Race. It's a part of the business of the Santa Clarita Valley. It's uh, revenue to the general fund that's used as the general fund is used that pretty much is fairly strong year to year to year. Um, so it's part of what this community does in different areas. You see filming all over Santa Clarita, not just here. So it's a component of the industry, which is very strong. COC founding board member and its vice president of the board of trustees, Bruce Fortine, echoes Williams' statement. Santa Clarita is kind of the film capital of the area. You know, we're, we're known as Hollywood North. Although filming at College of the Canyons generates upwards of a million dollars a year, not everyone here on campus is happy about it. On-campus filming has always been a problem here. Um, I understand that it brings a lot of money and revenue to the school, but it just seems like it's really disrespectful as far as like the students are concerned because it takes up parking spaces, which we're already in drastic need of. It takes up a lot of um, classroom space and stairwell space, elevators, everything else, like all the resources that we have are completely taken by the film crew. I mean, I've been late to multiple classes because I'm trying to find a parking spot and I show up on time with plenty of time to find a parking spot just like normal and I can't find one because now we've lost like a third or a half of a parking lot. I mean, you have complaints like any impact in any public space. The positive outweighs the negative. The negative is kind of more than it's needed there. Some people are very sensitive to their environment, which I understand, I respect that. The trade-off is very much on the side of we make a good income from it. It's something that we all put up with. Even the chancellor, you know, her husband will drive around looking for a place to park, just like the rest of us. Still, there are those who beg to differ. College employees, who were reluctant to speak on camera for fear of reprisal, spoke to Cougar News on a condition of anonymity. One of their grievances is the lack of communication and advance notice of on-campus filming. Faculty is notified through the document that we present that details as much as we know in a summary the day before or possibly two days before because the schedule of the day doesn't come up till the day before. Not every faculty member gets that. It goes mainly to department and executive cabinet. So the necessary people are notified relative to the impact. Employees cite student tardiness, closure of faculty parking lots, and lack of respect for academia among their grievances. They suggest only filming in areas when not in use by students, a minimum of one week's notice before filming is due to begin, and reasonably convenient parking. Compared to past years, filming at COC now represents nearly half of the school's local revenue. But because the proceeds go into the school's general fund, there's no way to determine where and how those funds are spent. Tweet us at COC underscore Cougar News and tell us what you think about filming at COC. And now it's time for entertainment. We're here with Ariel Thompson. Ariel, everyone knows I taught Chris Brown how to dance, but you, they're doing some uh, 
instruction at COC, as I understand. Yeah, the Hip Hop Club is actually running it this weekend. I'll tell you more about it. Awesome. If you don't have plans this weekend and would like to show off your groovy moves, the Performing Arts Center is hosting Dancing at the Pack to celebrate the COC Dance Department with its 10-year anniversary. This event will feature COC's very own Hip Hop Club. Tickets are only $5 to $10 at the Canyon's Black Box Theater, so don't miss it. And be sure to check out their website at santaclaritaperformingartcenter.com. If you're having trouble with finding something to wear this summer, my fellow Hollywood North Entertainment host, Taylor Villanueva, is going to tell you a little bit about what are the hottest looks. Let's take a look. Welcome back to Hollywood North Entertainment, where we're bringing you the latest on all things movies, music, television, and fashion. I'm your host, Taylor Villanueva, and you're watching Fashion Minute. Look number one is a perfect day outfit for a casual walk through the park. Stay in style by pairing a simple flowy tee with fun colored pants. Add sandals to pull the look together. The best part about spring is the spring dresses. A colorful maxi dress will make heads turn. A dress with pockets is even more practical, leaving you room to keep your favorite lip gloss on hand. And sometimes dresses can even make for a great two-in-one. Turn your dress into a cute top by simply tying up the back end with a hair tie. And let's not forget a classic look, jeans. Your favorite pair doesn't always have to be boring if you match them up with a pretty top. Choose a sleeveless shirt with lots of patterns like wide stripes and lace. Those are my favorite picks for this week. Which of these did you love the best? Leave a comment with your choice down below. Thanks again for watching Hollywood North Entertainment. Make sure to follow us on Twitter and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Taylor Villanueva, and this has been your Fashion Minute. The rap group NWA is making their way to the movie theaters from the streets of Compton this coming August. The movie tells the story of 80s and 90s rap legends Snoop Dogg, Ice Cube, Easy e and lastly Dr. Dre. With only having their honest rhymes and hardcore beats, these men put their frustration about life into the most powerful weapon they had. Just hit that first beat hard, all right? You cruising down the street. All right. Cruising down the street in my six foot. Hey, that was dope, eh? Starring the film will be Keith Seinfeld playing Snoop Dogg, Jason Mitchell playing Easy e Corey Hawkins playing Dr. Dre, and Ice Cube's own son, O'Shea Jackson Jr., playing his father's part. The movie takes us back to where it all began, where these five guys were just regular kids trying to survive in a dangerous part of California where they had to call home. This movie is produced by the actual members of NWA, Dr. Dre and Ice Cube. Straight Outta Compton isn't just an album, it's now going to be an inspiring movie, so be sure to check it out. Kanye West isn't a college dropout anymore. Mr. West showed his emotional side this last Monday while receiving his honorary doctorate from the Art Institute of Chicago. Lisa Wainwright, the dean of faculty and vice president of the college, decided to honor Mr. West after reading an interview with him in which he said he would love to attend the college. Kanye couldn't hide his pride and joy when he took the stand dur during the ceremony and gave his thank you speech. The university told Complex that the honorary doctorate was given to Kanye for being influential and being earned for all of his hard work as an artist. As diplomas were being handed out, Mr. West took a breather, grabbed his diploma, and left right away to catch a plane. Dr. West then left the building. Electric cars have become common for some people, but what about electric skateboards? Kalik Osborne tells us more about the Marble Born. Being funded last year in May came the world's lightest electric skateboard, Marble. Kickstarter team Marble from Tampa, Florida met their funding goal to reach $90,000 to help bring this project to life. After overreaching their goal with roughly $366,000, Marble started shipping to skaters all around the world in July of 2014. It wasn't until recently when they became also the fastest electric skateboard with speeds of 25 miles per hour compared to Boosted, the second most lightest electric skateboard on the market. This year's goal for Marble is to raise enough money to unlock a 45-minute faster charger cable that will be sold along with the skateboard at pre-order. Pretty incredible. I never thought I'd hear the words doctor and Kanye West in the same sentence. Yeah, Kim Kardashian was actually really proud of him oh, for sure that. Oh, sure she was. Of course she was. <laughs> Getting the chance to have your work judged to be displayed for the public to view can be both unnerving and a dream for some artists. 
but for students at College of the Canyons, the opportunity has come full circle for the 19th time to date. Just yesterday was the 19th annual COC student exhibition at College of the Canyons' own art gallery. Take a look around and guests will find photography, drawings, paintings, sculptures, graphic design, and two-dimensional design. The exhibit will be on display until Wednesday, May 10th and will be open to the public on Tuesday through Thursday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. To schedule viewing appointments or for any guest information, call 661-362-3612. Every first Thursday of the month, the Santa Clarita Valley holds an art slam in New Hall. Georgia Rios tells us more. This past Friday, Santa Clarita held its monthly art slam in Old Town New Hall. Despite the clouds, cold weather, and eventual rain, chalk artists came out and decorated Main Street with masterpieces ranging from Disney scenes, child portraits, and abstract art. The art slam is usually held along with a jam session, which is centered on cultural movement and music but because of the weather, it was canceled. The Art Slam and Jam sessions take place the first Thursday of every month. The next Art Slam will be on June 4th, featuring African dance and drums. Be sure to be there. For Cougar News, I'm Georgia Rios. College of the Canyon students have made their voices heard in languages from around the world through a medium that we all are familiar with, poetry. Cougar News reporter Aaron Lanuza was there to capture some of those languages in practice. Piano teacher. Every semester, the department holds their international poetry reading, exposing their students to new language and new ideas. Va llegando la noche, ya no se mira el mar. Dans les rues et dans les soirs. Ano chipa tlaltipac. Aunque no tiene permiso, mi corazón la busca y ella no está conmigo. Student performances did not only include an international poem, but also translations with a brief history of their piece. The poem that I chose uh, is called Nikito, and it kind of dwells upon the fact that material things, as well as um, like life itself, is temporary. Del Cachalchiwit no Shamani, no Teokuitlat Intlapani. We, we don't know what to do because right now we have, uh, last time we had 37 readers. Each semester is just growing, there are more, there's more interest on the part of students, even uh, at the level of 101. Whether these students are reading international poetry for extra credit or for the love of language, the popularity of the international poetry readings grow ever larger each semester. After a long night of poetry, Dr. Acosta and some of her students decided to go back to Chili's and have drinks and eat some food together. Cheers. 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 Salud. For your Cougar News, I'm Aaron Lanuza. And don't forget to check out CougarNews.com. They're showing up all across the Santa Clarita Valley, and they're inspiring adults and children to slow down and pick up a book. Cougar News reporter Judy Ritana has the story. No, this isn't a birdhouse or a mailbox. It's a little free library. This is one of the many popping up in Santa Clarita Valley. Little free libraries can be described as community book swaps. There are no library cards, due dates, or late fees, and you don't have to whisper or stay quiet. The Little Free Library movement was founded by Todd Bolt in 2009. He built the first one to look like a schoolhouse in honor of his mother who was a school teacher. And it's for people to come and just uh, get together and bring the community together and enhance reading and everybody enjoy um, the opportunity to read. The concept for free little libraries is simple. You can take a book, or leave a book. It brings the community together. Um, we're so busy with everyday life that people never really stop and pause and say hello. And while you're standing here, it's such an inspiring thing to do that people will actually start talking and getting to know your neighbors and everyone in the community. Holguin opened up her little library just last week. Hers is modeled to look just like her house. I'm looking to actually put different languages in here. I would love to see a library filled with Arabic books, Spanish books, and anything so it just embraces all the community that's here. There are currently an estimated 25,000 little libraries around the world. Santa Clarita is currently home to six official little libraries. This is Judith Bertana for Cougar News. We all know the saying, reach for the stars, and we all know it's not humanly possible, but this past Friday, folks at the Canyon Country Campus got to do the next best thing. Here's more with Austin Preciado. 
COC hosted its annual star party at the Canyon Country Campus Friday, May 1st, which attracted many amateur astronomers to teach the public about what is in the sky. College of the Canyon has a star party here, I think it's twice a year, and they invite our club and a few other clubs to come and have a star party here. It's mostly to inform uh, what's up in the sky and show them things that they've probably never ever seen before. The clubs at COC also battled it out with their annual catapult contest. Now we're promoting clubs and we're also just like having a competition with each other. We've been working on the catapults for about two months and we've all come together in like I think groups of like three to maybe seven people. And the prize that they get if they win is? It's all bragging rights yeah, basically, bragging rights. definitely, because <laughs> this happens every semester. So we should be having fun next semester being like, oh yeah, we won, but I'm not saying that we're going to win. We're actually part of the underdogs. Like, we're one of the bottom on the underdogs. Because Math Club yeah. barely just started. The Star Party is an annual tradition here at College of the Canyons. So be sure to come out next year and join in the fun. This has been Austin Preciado reporting for Cougar News. Still to come on Cougar News, we check out some local fun at Castake Lake. Also, we have your update on college and high school sports. Don't go anywhere. Hey, this is T-Boz at TLC. This is Batman. I'm Michael C. Morona. And I'm Danny Tamarelli. Hi, this is Ming Chen. This is Mike Zapsik. Hi, it's Louie Anderson. I'm Weird Al. I'm Florence Henderson. And you're watching. And you're watching. And you're watching. And you're watching. And uh, you're watching. And you lucky people are watching. Cougar. Cougar News. Cougar News. Cougar News. Cougar News. Cougar News. Cougar News. You're watching Cougar News. <laughs> And I'm a cougar. Stay tuned. Habitat for Heroes. Really, it's a story about people. Letting people see that they're not alone, they're not isolated. We're here to help. And we need to work on behalf of our veterans. Then we can really change that veteran's ability to reintegrate into the community. Habitat for Heroes is not just rebuilding homes, but it's rebuilding lives. And that's the message we want to get across. Get involved. Visit HabitatSCV.org and find out how you can help. And away! Last week, the Santa Clarita YMCA held a superhero-themed 5K. The event was part of the YMCA's Healthy Kids Day. Healthy Kids Day is a national campaign to improve the health and well-being of children. Across the country, more than a thousand YMCAs held free community events to get kids moving. Here in the Santa Clarita Valley, Kids and adults put on their best capes and costumes. The morning started with a 5K for adults and later a shorter run for kids. Medals were given upon reaching the finish line, but the fun didn't stop there. After the run, there were a variety of fun activities, including a rock climbing wall and even giant hamster balls to run in. Runners from all over the world took off at the same time in a race for a cure for spinal cord injuries. Our very own Cougar News reporter Chantel Del Aguila tells us more. Santa Clarita was one of the 32 cities around the world that was host to the second annual Wings for Life World Run, which supports research for spinal cord injuries. This race is unlike any other with each city starting exactly at the same time and a finish line that chases you. The chase car is essentially a finish line. These are our timing devices that we have. Um, they pick up uh, the bibs that we gave the runners. And so what we do, we start about 30 minutes after the runners. We start about at a nine miles an hour and then we just slowly start gaining. And once we catch up to the runners, once we catch you, that's it. More than 3,000 participants ran locally in support for finding a cure for spinal cord injury. From casual runners to Olympic athletes. Uh, it's definitely uh, something that's really important to me and of course I want to help as much as I can and um, it's really honored to be out here and supporting the cause. Uh, it's, it's really cool to be able to just put spinal cord injuries on the map and uh, a lot of people that maybe didn't know anything about that because you know this could happen to anybody and 
it's good to raise money so that it's in place and it means a lot to just have all the support from the community. Local winners were Thibault Baronian at 34.3 miles and Shannon Ralves at 29.6 miles. The finish line behind you is a great concept. It's you're running, you're just hoping that you can get to the certain miles that you have a goal for, and then when you pass that, you're kind of pacing, then you really start pacing in order to wait till that car comes. The, the 30th first kilometer was good. After, uh, it, it was uh, so, so hard for me. The uphill was hard and the sun and the jet lag, I am so tired. <laughs> Once again winning the world run title was Ethiopian runner Lemmerwerk Katima, who ran a total of 49.7 miles in Austria. Thanks so much. I'm very happy. Uh, today I'm very lucky because the weather it is very difficult and it's very tough. For Cougar News, I'm Chantel Delightful. And now it's time for sports. We're here with our very own Andrew Gold. Andrew, two words. Men's golf. Men's golf. We got a lot to tell you about that. Also, have a uh, new Cougar football player donning a new New Jersey next year. Great. Tell you more. Start off. Cougars offensive lineman EG, EJ Della Ripa will be wearing Vanderbilt black and gold for the final three years of his college career. The six foot four freshman signed his letter of intent on Tuesday after playing just one year at COC. Head coach Ted Ayasenda said, "Quote: EJ's upside is extremely high." and I'm very happy for Coach Mason and Vanderbilt. Looking for their second state title in the last three years, COC Golf has been on quite the roll as of late. After coming up short in 2014, the College of the Canyons golf team bounced back with a vengeance this year at the state finals, finishing with a five-man score of 733, eight strokes ahead of second place and tournament host Reedley College. Eric Kim and Sam Sloman each carded identical 36-hole scores at 145, to lead the Cougars to their seventh state title and second since 2013. Now we move on to baseball. COC was unable to capitalize on a strong start to their year. After beginning the season 7-3, the Cougars struggles, struggled once they hit conference, going 11-10, finishing fifth in the WSC South and 19-17 and overall, which wasn't enough to make the playoffs. They did, however, boast seven players with all conference honors, including pitchers J.C. Cloney, Colin Dudley and Zachary Hanks, as well as second baseman Colton Burns, third baseman Dylan Fryer, designated hitter Jake Sperlin, and outfielder Roy Verdejo. The softball team was also a victim to an early exit from the season. Despite being ranked number 10 in the state, the girls were eliminated in the first round of the playoffs by Citrus College, losing a best of three series two to one. Two of the girls were named to the all-conference team though, First baseman Caitlin Shrevs and catcher Lauren Anderson, who was also named the WSC Conference Player of the Year, as well as first team All-State. This past Sat Thursday, the Foothole League swim meet took place at the Aquatic Center. Starting at the top, Saugus superstar Abby Weitzel gave the Centurions an early lead in the 200 medley, but Julia Wolf and Valencia outtouched hard at the finish. As for the boys 200, Ian Brower of West Ranch was the top qualifier in lane four, but look at Valencia's Johnny Ellery rally to get to the wall and just miss the meet record. Azowski was a close third. On to the 200 IM, keep an eye on Nicole Popoff. The Valencia sophomore cruised to a new league and meet record in just under two minutes and one second. That time also good for a high school All-American status. On to the sprint events. The 50-yard free Hearts Tamara Santoyo got to the wall first. Moments later, her teammate Austin Barrero outraced Tyler Tran to the wall in a fast time of 21.47 seconds. Meantime, 17 years ago, now Olympic medalist and then Hart senior, Anthony Irvin went low in the 100 free. Today, Cole Cogswell took out the Foothill League's longest mark with a time of 44.8 seconds. Cool. That was senior year. I want to come have fun. Um, I swam the 100 free, racing Tyler, one of my best friends. Um, I just had a good time and swam. It was a good result. Broke the record, so I was happy. For the second straight year, Valencia swept both varsity and JV, JV, but Hart gained a small consolation prize by sweeping both the boys and girls 400 freestyle relay. Now there's quite a bit of excitement going on in the next couple of weeks in the Santa Clarita Valley. Top athletes will be flooding the city in two events that you won't want to miss. Celebrating its 10th year racing through California, the Amgen Tour will pass through Santa Clarita for the seventh time in those 10 years. Tomorrow, 
Cyclists will finish Stage 5 of the tour along Magic Mountain Parkway at the Westfield Town Center. Festivities will begin at 11 a.m. and the inter entertainment will continue up until cyclists race into town between 3.30 and 4.30 p.m. Also, a little bit of breaking news on that. Uh, the Amgen Tour will be staying in town until Friday due to bad weather up in Big Bear. So they're going to be staying here and doing time trials. So if you can't make it Thursday, come out on Friday. Moving on, on May 20th, Valencia Country Club will be hosting a U.S. Open qualifying event, which will give local golfers a chance at living their dream and possibly playing in the U.S. Open. One of over 100 events over a three-week span, each local qualifier consists of 18 holes with several players advancing to sectionals from each event. The goal is to earn a spot in the 156-player field at Chambers Bay to compete alongside some of the biggest names in golf. Now, there's been a lot of talk about the deflate gate scandal involving Tom Brady and the Patriots. Tom Brady has been suspended for the first four regular season games next season, and the team has been fined $1 million, as well as being forced to surrender two draft picks, a first round pick in 2016, and a fourth rounder in 2017. An appeal is expected from both the team and the player. Team owner and CEO Robert Kraft was quoted saying, Despite our conviction that there was no tampering with footballs, it was our intention to accept any discipline levied by the league. Today's punishment, however, far exceeded any reasonable expectation. It was based completely on circumstantial rather than hard or conclusive evidence. For more on the Deflate Gate scandal, check out He Said, She Said as I make a special guest appearance and talk more in depth with Nick Viverka. That's all I got for sports. Back to you, Enzo and Laura. Local kids got hooked on some outdoor fun at the lake last weekend. Our own Kimberly Pressler has more. During the first Saturday of the month, Friends of Castaic Lake kicked off their fifth annual Tom Stout Memorial Fishing and Fun for Kids Day. A crowd of nearly 400 very excited young anglers and their families gathered at Upper Castaic Lake and were given free tackle boxes filled with potsy baits and a fishing rod courtesy of Sport Chalet. Kids ages 15 and under then put their fishing skills to the test in a special contained portion of the lake where the day before, lifeguards netted it off. We weigh down this net so the fish can't get out of it. We enclose the area and fishing game brings down some trout and they stock it. After fishing, the kids were treated to a free lunch from Costco and raffles and prizes were given away to the participants. But the best part of the day? seeing the kids faces I mean it's it's unbelievable when you see these kids who've never caught fish before bring in a stringer full of fish for Cougar News I'm Kimberly Pressler that does it for this edition of Cougar News I'm Laura Fichla remember you can catch us on the web at cougarnews.com and I'm Enzo Marino you can also send us news tips and story ideas to our Twitter handle COC underscore Cougar News. Also, make sure to tune in on May 27th for a special drought edition of Cougar News where we will focus on the state's current water crisis. Have a good night, everybody. 